In this video, we're going to be covering the basics of some common hand deformities that you'll encounter in your courses and also when you're studying for the board exam. So the first hand deformity is called mallet finger. So you can see mallet finger over here on the right, specifically affecting the DIP joint of the third digit. So mallet finger is an acute injury caused by axial compression. So axial compression to one of the fingers, normally it's going to be the longest finger, and for most people that's digit three, although it could also affect digits four and two depending on where the contact occurred. So it's common in basketball, volleyball, or other contact sports where something might be forcibly hitting your hand specifically your fingers. So if you think of somebody passing a basketball and the basketball is coming really fast and it hits an outstretched third digit like this, well then it's going to forcibly jam it into hyperflexion, which can cause a rupture of this tendon on the dorsal aspect. Remember that going to each of these digits, there is a tendon, it's an extensor tendon, but it goes over the dorsal aspect, across the PIP joint, and then ultimately it goes across the DIP joint to attach on the distal phalanx. And so if that tendon gets ruptured by that hyperflexion, axial compression injury, well then you can no longer actively extend at the DIP joint. And so it'll just be resting here in this flexed position. Now a couple important notes here. Mallet finger only affects the DIP joint. It does not affect the PIP or the MCP joint. So if you have an additional deformity, let's say the PIP joint in addition, to the DIP joint, well, you need to consider something else. And we'll be talking about a couple of those in just a few minutes, like the swan neck or a boutonniere deformity, okay? The other thing here is that even though this tendon is ruptured here, you won't be able to actively extend that joint, but you can still passively extend it, okay? That passive extension can still be painful though, especially if there's swelling in the area and it may have a little bit of restricted movement, but you should still be able to passively extend at the DIP joint. So that is mallet finger. Now the second hand deformity is what's called trigger finger. And understand that on a very superficial level, trigger finger looks very similar to Dupuytren's contracture, which we'll see on the next slide, but there's a few key important differences. So in trigger finger, which is shown here, this is an overuse injury involving excessive digital flexion. So if somebody has a job or an activity that they do all the time where they're having to make a grip, a fist over and over again involving digital and wrist flexion, that's gonna predispose somebody to developing trigger finger. Right here you see trigger finger of the second digit, down here it's actually of the fourth digit. But in either case, there's gonna be inflammation of this tendon, so that would be a tendonitis, or it's of the tendon sheath that that tendon uh, glides through during normal movement, and that would be tenosynovitis. Either way, whether or not the, the tunnel here, the sheath is thickened, or the tendon is inflamed, it's gonna make gliding of that tendon through the sheath more difficult. And so it'll make it to where the finger kind of gets stuck, usually in a flexed position, like you see in either of these pictures. Okay? Now an important thing with trigger finger is that the affected finger can still be straightened actively or passively. Okay? Just because the finger gets stuck like this doesn't mean that if you don't use enough effort, you can't straighten it. You can still straighten it. Uh, there might be a little popping that occurs as it's really forcing itself uh, through that tendon sheath, but you can still actively straighten it with enough effort and you can also passively straighten it, okay? That's very different than what we see with Dupuytren's contracture. So Dupuytren's contracture is not an overuse injury. In fact, they're not even sure exactly what causes it, other than the fact that it's hereditary, it seems, and then there's other associated factors like diabetes, other inflammatory conditions, smoking, alcohol consumption, etc. Now, in Dupuytren's contracture, you begin to see these little nodules. If you look really closely right there, there's a slight thickening of that tendon that's going out to the fourth digit. And by the way, the fourth digit is the most commonly affected digit in Dupuytren's contracture, whereas trigger finger can affect any one of them fairly equally. So initially you see these nodules, and eventually as there's more and more inflammation, you end up getting that nodule converted just to a thickening in general of that tendon. So if you have your hand outstretched like this, you actually can see that thickened tendon there, even without contracting the muscle. Okay? 
eventually that thickening turns into an actual contracture where the tendon and or the muscle itself are shortened chronically. And so they're flexor tendons, so it forces these digits, here it's numbers four and five affected into a flexed position. Now with trigger finger, if you did enough effort, you could actively extend the finger or passively you can do it. In Dupuytren's contracture, you are not gonna be able to actively extend the digit because there's an actual contracture there for the flexor tendons. But you also are not gonna be able to passively extend it. So trigger finger can actively and passively extend with enough effort. Dupuytren's contracture, total extension, either passively or active is impossible. Okay, that's a big difference between these two, other than the mechanism being hereditary, otherwise unknown for dupuytrens, then trigger finger is overuse, okay? Now, the swan neck deformity, that's what's shown right here. So a swan neck deformity is caused by damage to the palmar ligament, which facilitates PIP flexion, so flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint right here, okay? If you damage that ligament that normally facilitates PIP flexion, well then you're not gonna have flexion at the PIP joint. In fact, you're gonna have hyperextension at the PIP joint. And then you're also gonna have a compensatory flexion at the DIP joint. So in the end, DIP flexion and PIP hyperextension, that is characteristic of a swan neck deformity, okay? If there's only DIP flexion, but no PIP hyperextension, that kind of rules down a swan neck deformity and you need to go back and consider maybe there was a mallet finger issue there, okay? But DIP flexion, PIP hyperextension. This can be an acute injury where you actually have a rupture of that ligament or there can be a chronic weakening of that tendon through chronic inflammation. This is something that we might see in rheumatoid arthritis. So this deformity, swan neck deformity, uh, can exist by itself or it can exist as a secondary effect of autoimmune diseases like RA, which we'll see in just a minute. So that's a swan neck deformity. Very similar, but sort of opposite, is the boutonniere deformity. So in the swan neck, we had DIP flexion. Now in the boutonniere deformity, we have DIP hyperextension, okay? And then whereas in the swan neck deformity, we had PIP hyperextension, now in the boutonniere deformity, we have PIP flexion. And so basically the relative positions of these two joints just flips, they're opposite one another. And again, here it's caused by damage to the PIP central slip, okay? Again, for an acute case, you can just have a rupture of that, which would cause a boutonniere deformity. But again, you can also have chronic inflammation associated with autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, where you have a progressive weakening of that PIP central slip, and eventually you form this boutonniere deformity. Again, autoimmune diseases, you can see both of these two deformities associated with them, okay? But we do not define rheumatoid arthritis or other conditions by having a swan neck deformity or boutonniere deformity. It just is associated with them. When we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, we're talking about some other things like drift of the digits and drift of the wrist. So right here you see advanced rheumatoid arthritis in an individual's left hand. And we see that the wrist and the digits, particularly at the MCP joints, have an altered resting position. So at the wrist, the wrist tends to be more angled towards the thumb, towards the radial side. So we would call that a wrist radial drift. It basically means there's excessive radial deviation at the wrist at rest. And then at the digits, we have ulnar drift, so digital ulnar drift, meaning that the fingers are going to tend to deviate more towards the pinky side or towards the ulnar side. So excessive digital ulnar deviation. And that tends to be more prominent at the MCP joints, uh, but you can also have some ulnar drift at the PIP joint. Uh, it's not really apparent except for at this third digit. If you look really carefully, you can sort of see that at the PIP joint, this distal segment right here, so the intermediate and distal phalanx, are actually oriented a little bit more towards the ulnar side than the proximal phalanx. Okay? But in general, you would see the effects at the MCP joints first and then the PIP joints after that. 
One very important thing about rheumatoid arthritis that might seem kind of trivial is that you have a positive rheumatoid factor, meaning that if you take a blood sample of somebody with active rheumatoid arthritis, you're gonna find elevated levels of RF, rheumatoid factor. There are other autoimmune diseases where you also have elevated RF, but the reason that's important is because when we get to psoriatic arthritis, you no longer have elevated rheumatoid factor. In fact, it's negative for rheumatoid factor. This blood test right here is a very important distinguishing factor between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Another important thing with psoriatic arthritis is it tends to not affect the PIP and MCP joints as much. It actually affects the distal interphalangeal joint, the DIP joint more. And you can see here, especially on the third digit, there's swelling at the DIP joint. There's also a little bit of swelling at the fifth digit, a little bit less at the fourth and the second. But the DIP joint tends to become swollen and hypomobile in psoriatic arthritis. And because of this thickening and reddening due to the swelling, it sometimes gets the name sausage fingers, but the correct term would be dactylitis. And this can occur both in the fingers and in the toes. Also, psoriatic arthritis is gonna have greater adverse effects on the skin. Uh, it's not always associated with psoriasis, but many times it is. And the psoriasis can occur everywhere. It can occur on the hands, but very commonly it actually occurs on the elbows. So you get this very dry, flaky, scaly skin, and that would be the skin issues that are associated with psoriatic arthritis. But understand that psoriatic arthritis is specifically referring to the joints being affected. It is a different disease than psoriasis. Just because somebody has psoriasis does not mean they have psoriatic arthritis. To have psoriatic arthritis, you have to have an autoimmune disease that is specifically attacking the joints of the hands and the feet. There just may be other associated symptoms. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the various hand deformities that you might see in your courses and also when studying for the board exam. Thank you. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.